Recording in progress. What do we have, David? One Looks more. like uh, we have everybody here except for Supervisor Samidian. Already? Oh, yeah? And Coco's here too, apparently. Okay, you hooligans. Behave or you're out of here. Where's the deputy sheriff when you need one? Law enforcement isn't the only response, Mike. <laughs> That's right. <but> <laughs> up <back. laughs> You're yeah. welcome. Health, social services. All right, still we're just waiting for our supervisor, Samidian. Who has just shown up? Present, <laughs> sir. This is somewhere on the border, right? Right, Vice President Ellenberg? Sorry? A water bottle somewhere between law enforcement and uh, behavioral health. Sprayed them. I sprayed them. I just hold the bottle up and they oh, leave. Sorry, I had no idea what you were talking about. All right. We now have Supervisor Samidian here. Dave, will you please take a roll call just to reestablish our quorum? Good afternoon. Supervisor Lee. Be present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Samidian. You're muted, sir. Here. Thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. I'm here. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you very much. We're now going to resume our meeting with item number 11. And our staff, let's, oh, this is brought to us by Supervisor Chavez and Ellenberg. Go right ahead, please, one of you. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll go ahead and get started, and then um, Supervisor Ellenberg will join in. Um, item 11 is expanding broadband services to Santa Clara County, and it's um, a multi-step approach to engaging our staff in determining what the opportunities are for us to do just that. I want to thank Supervisor Elmberg in particular for co-signing this referral and for her long work on broadband expansion with the California State Association of Counties and Joint Venture Silicon Valley. This referral will give us an opportunity to expand affordable, reliable, high-speed fiber optic broadband internet service in Santa Clara County and in those areas that are currently under, unserved or underserved through a municipally owned internet service provider by taking advantage of recently authorized state and federal funding sources. The past 20 months have brought home to all of us just how re um, vital, reliable high-speed internet is in the 21st century in Santa Clara County. The most obvious example is that we could not conduct this meeting without it. However, tens of thousands of Santa Clara County residents do not have reliable internet access at the speed necessary to participate in this meeting or to participate in a virtual classroom, or to conduct a telehealth appointment with their doctor. CSAC estimates that the number is more than 73,000, and 70,000 of those have no reliable access to the internet at all. An additional 680,000 residents in our county only have access to high-speed internet through a single provider, which puts them at the mercy of large corporations with a monopoly power on and can get whatever price they like. This affects not only individuals and families, but small businesses as well. This is the digital divide, but we have an opportunity right now to close that digital divide. In July, G Governor Gavin Newsom signed SB 156, which dedicates $6 billion to closing the digital divide statewide, including more than 2 billion for local last mile high-speed broadband connections and those are the connections to individual residents and businesses. President Biden's Infrastructure Bill and Build Back Better Act make billions of additional federal dollars available for expansion. Supervisor Ellenberg and I believe the county has an opportunity to play a leadership role by providing affordable internet service because the private sector has had decades to connect the underserved and unserved in our county and have not done so yet. The county provides health care for those who can't afford it because we know that a healthy population benefits the entire community. A connected population also benefits the entire community. We've had lo a long successful tradition of local government operating utilities. The city of Santa Clara provides electricity through the Valley 
uh, through, I'm sorry, Silicon Valley Power and the city of San Jose provides water services through San Jose Municipal Water. I am, I'm confident that we have an opportunity to be successful in, in internet services. To remind my colleagues that don't need reminding, this is an equity issue. The digital divide overwhelmingly affects some of the county's most economically disadvantaged areas in San Jose's east side and south county. This is an economic development issue. In 2009, the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee opened a fiber optic internet service serving an estimated 364,000 residents. And according to an August 2020 study by the University of Tennessee Chattanooga between 2011 and 2020, nearly 10,000 jobs were created or saved and $1.4 billion investment in startups development and taxes were brought to the region as a result. I'm confident that by going in this direction, we're gonna create opportunities for our local community. And I'm gonna turn it over to Supervisor Ellenberg. Super, thank you. Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you so much. And Supervisor Chavez, I assume you were making a motion to approve the referral. And if that thank is you. the case, I'm delighted to second it. Uh, and I wanna thank you as well for your work on the California State Association of Counties, the CSAC Working Group on Broadband. Uh, as a member myself of the exec committee of CSAC and the chair of the urban counties of California, we made it a high priority to get federal and state funding into our broadband infrastructures. I spent the better part of this past year advocating successfully to our state legislators and in the governor's office to invest $7 billion to actually close the digital divide. Supervisor Chavez's time on our broadband working group helped us to address, address some of the most serious issues uh, that have led to the digital divide, such as the need to invest in a transformative public infrastructure project to build a statewide open access middle mile network, which would reduce the costs for all last mile projects, giving the state a bigger bang for its buck and providing this opportunity for the county to play a role. Here in the heart of Silicon Valley, where the digital divide is hidden in the shadows of big tech companies, this investment will stabilize our county's children and families. In a world where doctor's appointments and parent-teacher conferences are predominantly digital, this investment will ensure that all our county's children and their families have access to the supports that will help stabilize them and set them up for success. At the height of the pandemic, the board, in partnership with the County Office of Ed, worked to provide devices and Wi-Fi hotspots to students and their families to assist with distance learning but we were only able to actually help the children if they lived or had access to areas where proper infrastructure was already in place. That concern led to my work with Joint Venture Silicon Valley and the County Office of Education to, um, to create several pilots in, in uh, areas of District 4 with little to no broadband infrastructure. We erected antennas on two schools that provided um, uh, Wi-Fi access for the surrounding neighborhood, and we are working on a third. Projects like this move the needle, but they are isolated. They are not part of a larger system, and we need to do more. Proactive approaches like the one we're proposing today better ensure that our children will not only survive, but thrive and become productive members of our communities. Finally, I want to thank everyone um, that has uh, shared comments on this item, especially uh, school board members at our press conference yesterday who are advocating so diligently for their students. As a former school board member myself, I know what resources are available to districts and that your needs are a microcosm of county services. And I hope that the passage of this referral will move us forward in providing more direct services to our county's family, families. Using the state's financial resources to expand broadband is a public good that is both moral and practical, and it's urgent. The best time to close the digital divide was 20 years ago, but the second best time is now. I'm proud to, super, to partner with Supervisor Chavez on this effort and ask respectfully for our colleagues' votes and support. There we go, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Simidian. Thank you, I, I am looking forward to supporting this measure in a minute, um, you know, a, an issue, uh, that is uh, undeniably compelling, I think. I just want to ask for a friendly amendment from the maker and the seconder, which is um, I want to be sure that we don't overlook <clears throat> um, 
individuals or households or even small businesses uh, in uh, other parts of the county where the need may not be quite so concentrated, but is nonetheless present. And you know these issues of equity um, are concentrated in some areas, but you know at the risk of stating the obvious, a disadvantaged family uh, still needs what it needs, uh, regardless of where it's it's located. So I would just like to ask if we could get one additional, admittedly run-on sentence, uh, which is consideration shall also be given to, and option for consideration options for consideration shall be provided for disadvantaged individuals, households, and small businesses, regardless of their location in the county, who face constraints in accessing affordable, high-quality broadband. And I don't know what that would look like. That's obviously why you all are making a referral to staff. Could be different technology, could be um, some program of uh, financial support for uh, economically disadvantaged uh, individuals or households, but I just want to make sure that we're not unnecessarily and inappropriately uh, constrained in terms of the geography. And that we would ask that be a friendly amendment. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Thank you, Vice President Ellenberg. Yes, in fact, um, Supervisor Simini, in the areas where I have been working are in District 4, which I understand as a full district does not have the same level of need um, as much of East San Jose and South County but in the neighborhoods in D4 that need it, they need it and there are no other options. So I absolutely support extending this to wherever is needed. Supervisor Smitty, anything else? No, if that's agreeable to the maker as well as the seconder. And again, I'll, I'll just read the language for the clerk very quickly. Consideration shall also be given to and options for consideration shall be provided for disadvantaged individuals, households, and small businesses, parentheses, regardless of their location in the county, end parentheses, who face constraints in accessing affordable, high-quality broadband. I know that's a bit more work for staff, but it seems to me if we're going to, you know, wrap our arms around this big, hairy, audacious goal, we should make it a big, hairy, audacious goal in its uh, full complexity and uh, appreciate the willingness to accept that as a friendly amendment. Thank you. Thank you. You got two yeses for an answer. Supervisor Lee. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, President Walsman. First of all, I want to thank uh, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor uh, Ellenberg for putting forth this really, really important uh, proposal. Uh, as we all know that uh, with, with this COVID that we've been living for two years, uh, that uh, broadband access is uh, clearly vital and indispensable for the part of our life. Uh, now, I know that this referral already calls out for the county to work alone with other uh, local government and nonprofits on the service model. I want to also make sure that our own Santa Clara County Digital Equity Consortium, it's uh, also involved in these efforts as the missions is to utilize data to inform proposals for federal, state and private sector grants that aid in the closing the connectivity gaps within the County of Santa Clara. The involvement may be implied, but I want to mention them specifically. Um, in fact, the next week's uh, FGOC meeting, we will be receiving a report from the Digital Equity Consortium that notes that the county has retained a highly sought after firm that is nationally recognized for the work in broadband planning. The consortium will work closely with this firm to prepare a broadband master plan that will include data collection and analysis regarding the needs of the community and local government agencies, an assessment of the broadband infrastructure market and the assessment of existing emerging and emerging technologies development of recommendations for both infrastructure and programmatic solutions for addressing digital divide issues in our county and the evaluation of available funding sources. Um, this consultant, consultant will also be pro, able to provide the county with grant writing and project management services for broadband projects on an as needed basis. So that being said, do you think if this referral um, might also be folded into the consortium's work uh, with the consultant on broadband planning so as not to duplicate efforts. Is that all right, Supervisor Chavez? I think the challenge is that um, I, I would ask uh, our staff to to take a look at that. And, and here's really what the challenge is. I don't know where they are actually in their, in their process, mm -hmm. but I think that Supervisor Lee raises an excellent, excellent point, which is we want to make sure we're utilizing all the resources 
um, that we have. And so I think our staff should actually absolutely speak to them. Um, I will say that we have been working um, also, uh, in fact, we have a, a staff person who's been working um, part-time with us whose whole um, background is in this area. And we've been partnering with Santa Clara uh, University. I see Catherine Sandoval, uh, Dr. Sandoval is on our list to speak. Um, and so I would ask staff at least to confer with them. And then when that this comes back to give us feedback on how that, how if there's an opportunity for any kind of overlap. Great. Mr. President Ellenberg, done all right with you as well? Yes, I, I appreciate the modifications by Supervisor Chavez and want to echo that we should absolutely consult and engage, uh, investigate and talk with them, but I don't want to predetermine a consultant or predetermine um, any outcomes or pathways forward uh, until we hear what administration has to say. Supervisor Lee, all right, good. Yes, thank you. All right, we've already got four votes that we know about. We've got speakers now jumping on. Let's give them one minute each. And speakers, you've already heard four people in favor of the motion. All right, Dave. One moment, please, while we get the timer up. Thank you very much. First speaker is Claudia Rossi. I've unmuted you. Please accept the unmute. You will have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Goodness, I thought I had two, so I'll try to fit it all in. Um, images of children huddled in fast food restaurant parking lots trying to access internet in order to attend school virtually remain seared in the hearts of communities that have been left behind. I stand in support of the families that have raised their voices to share stories of children who have abandoned their academic goals and those that now deal with declining health because they lack what is a fundamental utility in today's world. I stand in full support and gratitude of, uh, of this initiative, but I also ask that we engage uh, with the migrant communities in South County to fully um, assess the digital divide. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam President. Next speaker is Catherine Sandoval. I've unmuted you. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Um, good afternoon, supervisors. Thank you so much for bringing forward this important motion, um, which I stand in support of. I uh, uh, teach um, communications on energy law at Santa Clara University and also served as a commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission. And as a teacher in this county, I can attest to the problems with broadband access that our students face and our some faculty and staff sometimes face. And um, improving broadband access is gonna be important to equity, to the economy. Uh, by creating scalable networks, we'll be able to facilitate things uh, like precision agriculture and other types of innovation that can help not only South County, but the entire county to become a hub of innovation. Because as was said before, infrastructure is physical. So we need the physical infrastructure in order to have the digital access and therefore the economic access and equity. So I thank you for your support for this motion. The next speaker is David Wu. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is David Wu. I'm with the Santa Clara County Office of Education and I serve as their Chief Technology Officer. As a representative for the SACOE, we are in strong support of this potential investment in public infrastructure. For the past several years, we've been involved in numerous projects around the county to address digital equity for populations and communities that lack the infrastructure for high-speed internet. Uh, we have two projects to describe that we've recently been involved with. We, we, we were involved with connecting the Arturo Ochoa Migrant Center to remote, in a remote section of Gilroy to high-speed internet so that over 100 migrant students and their parents were able to connect to distance learning, do their homework, and access internet services. Thank you. Another pilot project has been a pilot project headed by our office to build a private LTE CBRS cellular-based wireless network connecting over 200 students and families in the Luther Burbank School District area. These are just two projects. In our recent work, we have been recognized the importance of more public infrastructure and bridging equity gaps for our underserved communities. It's critically important areas for where for profits are not investing. Next speaker is John Horner. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, supervisors, uh, all of you for your support of this effort. I'm John Horner, currently vice president of the school board at Morgan Hill Unified and former for eight years president and CEO of the Morgan Hill Chamber of Commerce. So two very different perspectives, but both lead to the same conclusion. This is an area where significant public investment is required. 
I think back to Lyndon Johnson's early days in pushing for rural electrification at a time when uh, electric utilities were over 100 years ago or nearly 100 years ago in the same place we are now. So thank you for the work and please look for our schools as possible cooperating partners. We have more publicly owned sites than uh, any other entity and there are some real possibilities to cooperate in this effort and thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Hyde. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Hyde speaking on behalf of Community Health Partnership. Broadband connectivity is more than simply access to the internet. For Santa Clara County residents, free, low cost and reliable broadband service will reduce barriers to, health, to telehealth and other services and improve the health and well-being of patients served by our community health centers. Thank you to the Board of Supervisors for moving to address the social and health disparities created by the digital divide. Community Health Partnership is happy to work with the county on these efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Rebecca Armendaris. You've been unmuted. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Honorable President Wasserman and Supervisors, Rebecca Armendaris, uh, Council Member, City of Gilroy. The lack of internet access sufficient for reliable teleconferencing or remote learning is a serious equity and economic development issue, which is felt especially hard by our South County families, in particular, those who work in the agricultural industry and work in the most rural parts of our city. The COVID-19 pandemic left us scrambling to provide the basic needs for these residents and all the more desperately for those who are even more vulnerable. This initiative to provide fiber internet service to those that need it and essential for modern life will create jobs and is a true investment in our future. Thank you for supporting this initiative. Thank you. Next speaker is Devin Conley. I've unmuted you. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. Thank you for allowing this time to speak and thank you for bringing this ground changing proposal to close the digital divide here in Santa Clara County. My name is Devin Conley and I am the president and co-founder of the Digital Equity Coalition. I am also a trustee on the Mountain View Wisman School Board. Internet access is a human right, and if there is one thing we have learned from COVID, it is that our community is only as safe and as healthy as the most vulnerable among us. You have heard not only from the members of the Digital Equity Coalition, but from school board trustees countywide that our students and their families need access to reliable, affordable, high quality broadband to have a seat on the classroom and access vital services. I am thrilled to see this motion going forward, and I would especially like to thank Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Ellenberg for their leadership and Supervisor Simidian for his friendly amendment, which would mean that the 30% low income students in my district are also served by this proposal. Next speaker is Marianne Dewan. Dr. Dewan, you have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, President Wasserman, and thank you, Supervisor Chavez and Ellenberg, for your leadership, advocacy, and partnership. Deeply grateful for our long term collaboration to address digital equity. Children and youth in the east side of San Jose, South County, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and our migrant education camps do not have reliable access to the internet. Access to the internet is an essential service, as you've heard. As County Superintendent, I'm charged with the responsibility to meet the needs of our most vulnerable youth and their families and to advocate for investments that will allow our youth to thrive. This is one of those investments. I encourage your support of this proposal. Thank you. Next speaker is Sharon Luna. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. I am so happy in regard to this bill um, that you are about to pass right now. I am a grandparent that um, had to have my three grandchildren come over to my house in order to use the internet. San Martin does not have access, at least in my location, to broadband. While I am not um, in a low income bracket, it created financial difficulties because I had to go from an $86 a month bill to a 168 month bill in order to provide access for four children that had to use um, the internet when they were distance learning. So I would like you to consider hardships in regard to those that are middle income um, 
and do not have that financial. Next speaker is James Hankins. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. This is James Hankins. I'm the owner of Hankins Information Technology and the Internet Provider in the South County area. Um, we are uh, partnering with FCC on bringing in um, CAF2 funds, RDOF funds. We're in the process of building fiber network in the South County area. And um, I would encourage the, uh, the, uh, the supervisors to uh, maybe partner with a company like ourselves that are already invested in building this out. We provide high-speed internet to areas of Morgan Hill, San Martin, Gilroy, Hollister. Uh, the Ochoa migrant camp that you heard about earlier, we're the ones providing that internet. We currently provide service to the Sheriff's Department, the Sheriff's Academy, uh, the medical clinic for Santa Clara County um, on 6th Street by Costco. Um, so I think there's a lot of areas where we could partner. And um, in some ways, I think you're talking about competing and probably taking business away from small businesses like myself. So I think we should open that discussion of how we can work together as opposed to against each other. Next speaker is Peter Landsberger. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, supervisors. I'm Peter Landsberger, a Los Altos resident and a trustee of the Foothill De Anza Community College District. As online classes, uh, support and services become ever more characteristic of the way our colleges do, do business, you need to know that the adverse effect of the digital divide are growing for Foothill and De Anza students and for students at every other institution of higher education in Santa Clara County, not to mention secondary and even primary school students. Statewide, 12% of co college students report having no access or limited or sporadic access to the internet. The numbers are much higher, up to 30% in some cases for lower income students and students of color. With SB uh, 156 and the Infrastructure Act, we have a chance to do something real. I urge you to support the referrals contained in item 11. Thank you. The next speaker is Maimona Afzal Berta. I have unmuted you. You have one minute to speak. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, supervisors who have expressed their support already. My name is Maimona Alsalberta. I'm the president of the Franklin McKinley School Board and vice president of the Digital Equity Coalition. Um, as a special education teacher in East San Jose, I've seen firsthand the struggle to help our students get access to internet connectivity and stay connected. I wanna thank Supervisors Chavez and Vice President Ellenberg for your leadership on this item. As you know, the lack of equity has been a long-standing issue, and it gives me great hope to see our county leading to close the digital divide um, for our community and really expanding the long internet access. Your action today is going to help expand the vital resources that our families and residents need. So thank you again for your support, and I encourage you to continue exploring the options for our communities. Mr. Chair, the remaining individual with their hand up spoke on this item during public comment during the consent calendar. So that gotcha. concludes our public speakers. Thank you very much for monitoring that, Dave. All right, we've got a motion. We have a second. We had 14 people all in favor of it. Two other supervisors said they wanted to support it. I'm in favor of it as well, but let's take a vote anyway. Dave. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank um, you. President yeah, Wasserman. Supervisor just, Chavez. Yeah, just real quickly. First of all, thank you to all the speakers who came out. And I, I do want to just lift up what James um, Hankin said that, you know, we are going to be looking, I, I would be encouraging the staff for looking at public private partnerships as well. And so I really appreciate him raising that. And I also wanted to say thank you to him for being in South County. That's for sure. I know of a lot of his work. All right, 12, 13, and 14, that was it. Can we go to our county executive? Dr. Smith, are you here or Miguel? I'm here. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of things to, to update the board about right. having to do with um, COVID. As everyone is well aware, Omicron is uh, in the county and spreading. I'm sure there's a lot more of it than we know about. We're doing our ongoing monitoring and genomics. Um, <clears throat> however, consistent with the spread of Omicron throughout the state, uh, the um, governor has announced a plan which will take effect tomorrow <clears throat> 
requiring masking in all public places. Um, I expect that that will be the first step. Uh, I expect more restrictions from state um, as the situation continues to progress. At this point, it looks like Omicron <clears throat> itself might not be <clears throat> the disaster, uh, but there are considerable concerns about other um, variants that will be coming our way because of a substantially unvaccinated population nationwide. And, and Dr. Worldwide. Smith, if I may, for clarification, you said all public places, you're saying inside, correct? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, was clear about that. <clears throat> also, at the same time uh, that this is going on, the uh, CDC and the federal uh, regulators are looking into the need for boosters and the fact that one does not, as an adult, attain sufficient protection unless one has had um, three shots. And so um, we're really encouraging everyone who's eligible to get vaccinated. This applies to adults, not to the children. We currently have about 42.5% of our residents, again, adults in the county who are eligible for boosters who have been boosted, and that's a good number. Um, we're moving ahead with uh, booster vaccinations and child vaccinations, as the board knows. And so um, we're continually concerned about getting the message out for everyone to get boosted who can be boosted. So that's basically all I have to update you today. Thank you for your report, Doctor. Turning now to County Council, James. Oops, Supervisor Smith and Supervisor Lee, questions of Dr. Smith. Oh. James, James, just one minute, please. Dr. Smith, please come back to the microphone. Supervisor Smith. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And Dr. Smith, I just want to um, reiterate the concern I have expressed previously. Well, right now it's about the feedback. Um, the concern I've expressed previously about our exhortations to the public for uh, about the importance of a booster, but the then uh, very challenging path towards getting a booster. I'll be asking uh, at Health and Hospital about that issue tomorrow, Mr. Chair, since it's not an agenda I cite them on today's meeting, but I wanted to sunshine it today and give uh, staff and not just the county executive, but the public health a uh, department as well, uh, full uh, notice that I'll be asking, you know, what can we do to step up our efforts? And more specifically, what are the legal possibilities uh, around some direction from the public health officer to private nonprofit providers who are not providing the booster in sufficient quantities to address the demand uh, and the need? Dr. Smith, just want to make sure you have heard that and that you and your team will be prepared to respond to that tomorrow at the appropriate time on our committee agenda, yes? Yes, we'll be ready. Thank Wonderful. you very much. Supervisor Lee, you had additional questions? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, it's uh, similar to uh, what uh, Supervisor Samidian actually just mentioned. So uh, as we have uh, allowed 16 year olds and above to get the vaccine uh, since last Thursday, I immediately scheduled an appointment for my 16-year-old uh, to uh, get her appointment. Uh, and certainly there wasn't anything available in the North County at all. So the only appointment I was able to get immediately, um, and we were able to get it like within 24 hours notice, was actually in Morgan Hill at the Paul Health Center. So we drove down there Saturday morning uh, very early. Uh, and I have to say, uh, that's actually my first time of visiting the Paul. It's a great facility. People are very motivated. The services were superb. And we were able to get in and out there very, very quickly. So I just want to. Have you enjoyed yourself in South County, Supervisor? Yes, 
Thank you. And I just want to say give kudos to the to our nurses and all the workers at the Paul for all the good work that they're doing for our residents. Um, so I just want to give some good good news uh, uh, to to pass along uh, to 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 the thank our uh, employees doing such great work. Um, the the issue of the Omicron variants is certainly very real, uh, and different uh, uh, reports are, are coming up regarding the uh, the transmissibility being more than double of Delta as last what well, I just last read. So this is going to be very very transmissible. Uh, so I think this is something that uh, we we really need to. Uh, uh, work hard uh, as, as we could do in terms of wearing masks. I think one of the biggest problems we have besides people unwilling to get vaccinated due to, uh, I would say, different sources of news we're getting uh, is the fact that I think there is a bit of complacency being developed. Um, folks who have been fully vaccinated with two shots thinking that they're safe, but as we have learned the waning uh, numbers after six months or so, or even less, uh, certainly is affecting the uh, the uh, the immunity uh, uh, going on. So I think it is so important for people to understand the need for getting the booster and I'll do my best. Uh, and I just wanna ask um, staff to make sure that we are reminding folks since we deal with the record of people getting the two shots for those who are eligible after the six month period to uh, make sure that we do send them email reminders and outreach to make sure that, that we're asking them to go get the boosters uh, ASAP due to the, the Omicron. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Supervisor Chavez. Uh, thank you. And I know this um, Supervisor Simidian and Lee um, will will look, I hope, to cover this tomorrow. I I, I do just want to ask uh, Dr. Smith um, if we have an update on capacity of our, our partner organizations for vaccines. I will get you something off agenda. I can't remember the numbers right off the top of my head. However, uh, we do know that Stanford and Kaiser are doing, um, shall I say, a better job of increasing their numbers significantly, particularly Stanford. Um, we still have poor numbers for uh, PAMP and uh, we are seeing an increase in the uh, <clears throat> commercial pharmacies, uh, retail pharmacies, so that's a good thing, but the numbers I'll have to get you off agenda, the actual numbers. Thank you. What I was hoping is even if it's verbal that um, that is part of the, the presentation to Health and Hospital tomorrow, if it's okay with the chair, that that um, be discussed because I, I think one of my concerns is that um, as as Supervisor Lee just raised, you know, going out to get his daughter an appointment, um, you know, we should honestly we should everybody with insurance should be able to go to their provider and get an appointment. And the fact that they're not doing that puts incredible strain on the county's uh, resources. And, um, and I know, Dr. Smith, that you've been really working hard, your staff, to try to motivate the other um, health organizations. But I'm, I'm concerned that the point you raised about the Omicron virus, that, that if, if this isn't the virus weakening, um, then what else coming down the pike? It, it puts us in a really terrible situation in terms of being able to be responsive. So. Um, even if it's a verbal update, I, I hope that's made public tomorrow and that, that there's formal communication to our partners about our um, expectations, you know, as we move through this next phase. Right. The, tomorrow we will have the numbers. I just don't happen to have them off the top of my head. We'll have the numbers for HHC and uh, we'll be able to work through that. Thank and we you. have informed our partners that we expect them to increase their numbers um, and the board will talk about what kind of leverage we could apply. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. I think that uh, covers our Omicron update and we continue to do what we were doing in Santa Clara County and we've got a great um, vaccination and booster rate going. So I, I think the uh, Santa Clara County should be proud of what it's doing and we can still do better. All right, James. 
There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of December 13, 2021, and that concludes my report. Thank you for an outstanding final report of 2021. With that, we move on to item 17, considering recommendations relating to the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. And I'm gonna flip over here for our, our monthly and the magnificent Paul Lorenz. Well, good afternoon, President Wasserman, uh, board members. Uh, including your package is an update on our budget report to HRSA. Um, also, we continue to our activities around COVID-19 in terms of both the uh, boosters as well as the flu vaccine. I would also note that in November, we did start our code, cold weather outreach program. And most of you know that it consists of a nurse and outreach workers, social workers, uh, to outreach to individuals on the streets and encampments. And we offer flu shots, uh, distribute blankets, hats, gloves, um, food, et cetera and also direct them to cold weather shelter locations when in fact they're active. Um, and this will continue through uh, the winter months. But with that being said, I'm happy to respond to specific questions that you may have. Thank you, Paul, I appreciate that. I don't see any, uh, one hand by Supervisor Chavez and we have no speakers on this. Go right ahead, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to, you know, I, I want to better understand um, about the mental health services that are being provided te by telehealth. Yes. Um, does this mean that when you encounter an individual in an encampment who who needs um, to be assessed by a psychiatrist for mental health or substance use, you do, you take an iPad to them and they're able to get that assessment right in real time? Yes, supervisor. So we do use iPad technology to bring those types of services to, to the clients in the field. So it's right away. It's right away. So we have the ability to, to make sure that when they're in the field that we have a provider available and then we connect them via the iPad. That's really, that's moving forward. That's really awesome. And at the end of that um, exchange, can the doctor then determine whether or not someone needs to be at EPS or at the sobering station or, or do they have that ability to connect them to the next service? Yes. Uh, not only do we do the assessment in the field by the staff, but should the consulting psychiatrist provide additional direction, then we do follow through on those, uh, those orders, if you will. Thank you. And then um, I just had one last kind of broad question for you about the, the, um, the flu shots and the and the um, you know continuing to do uh, vaccines. How open are people to getting a flu shot? You know, like this time around. Well, typically, we find that individuals are more apt in, in wanting to get a flu shot than and then more hesitant around the COVID nineteen. Although I think the staff have done a wonderful job in really educating them and encouraging them to get both the COVID nineteen as well as the flu vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Our action being requested is approve operational report and approve the budget progress so report. Motion by Chavez, I need a second. I'll be second. happy to second. All right, Motion, uh, second by Supervisor Lee. Again, we have no one from the public wishing to speak. Dave, a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to item number 18, the countywide video security camera surveillance use policy impact report. We've got Mike Shapiro, our chief privacy officer here. I'm gonna to turn to Supervisor Simidian to ask a question and move this along. Move we'll approval. Thank you, I'll second that. Any further discussion or questions? None, no members of the public here. Dave, a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. Vice President Ellenberg? Yes. And President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. With that, we move on to item number 19. Oh, baby. <clears throat> a temporary 
housing solutions for justice involved girls and gender expansive. We turn to our chief probation officer for Laura Garnett. And I believe we also have, I do see Judge Catherine Lucero here, the uh, presiding judge and uh, also a panelist. So I wanna give her as much time as she may need to address the board. Chief Garnett, Judge Lucero, take it away. Good afternoon, President Wasserman and members of the board. Um, we're happy to present this today. I believe we have, uh, actually, I'm not exactly sure who's presenting, so I'm not going to pretend. I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Chief Mike Sims. I think and so. I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. And this is a non action item, board member, simply to receive a report. Michael, take it away. Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, we are here to uh, speak about um, at the June 22nd board supervisor meeting, the board approved a referral to administration regarding options for considering consideration relating to uh, providing temporary housing solutions for juvenile involved girls and gender expansive youth. Um, so this report was done um, in partnership with the very Institute of Justice, the probation department and the department of family and children's services with assistance from county council. So we have a presentation and we'll remain open to questions if you have any. And I'd like to introduce Hannah Green from the very Institute of Justice and Probation Division Manager, Victoria Contreras Wolf, who will be doing this presentation. Um, so I will turn it over to Hannah. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. Um, I, my name is Hannah Green and I am a, thank you for the slides. Um, and I am a program manager at the Vera Institute of Justice. I work on a project called the Initiative to End Girls Incarceration. Um, and Vera has been providing no cost technical assistance to Santa Clara County through the Juvenile Justice Gender Responsive Task Force since 2019. And in partnership with the JJGRTF, community-based organizations and other systems and community leaders, we've been working to understand and develop strategies to disrupt pathways into custody and expand pathways out of custody for girls and gender expansive youth. Um, and I'm excited to be presenting alongside our partners at probation to share a set of recommendations that have been developed as really close collaboration between probation, DFCS, community-based organizations, and directly impacted young people. Um, you can go to the next slide. So before I talk about the recommendations themselves, I'll just highlight some of the core principles that have guided their development. So first, although the report presents recommendations for expanding the continuum of residential options, it's important to note that best practice is to avoid out of home stays wherever possible, and that has informed this work. And second, best practice is also to develop individualized plans and approaches for young people. And of course, a, a core tenant of trauma-informed care is an emphasis on centering the voice and choice of young people and deciding what options will work for them. And finally, directly impacted young people and the community-based organizations that support them have been essential leaders in the development of these solutions, and they'll need to continue to be at the table to design and implement these models should they move forward. Um, next slide. So just a little bit of background. When Vera completed a diagnostic assessment of Santa Clara's justice system, what emerged really clearly from both the data collection and conversations with stakeholders was that there was a sizable population of girls who were being confined, not because of public safety concerns, but either because there were concerns for the girls' safety, maybe child welfare or trafficking related, or there wasn't a clear safe location to release that young person to. And so this report outlines two models of home-like residential care that are aimed at filling this gap by expanding the continuum and developing specialized gender responsive out of home options. So I'll describe each of them briefly, but there's, there's much more detail in the report. So the first is a new four to six bed home-like residential setting with an emphasis on recruiting, training and retaining staff, particularly those with lived experience in navigating government systems. And the second is a model to resource and support the informal networks of care that already exist within communities by partnering with community-based organizations that are deeply embedded in local communities to identify, recruit, train, license, and pay families who could hold beds and welcome young people into their homes on a temporary basis. And to support young people in accessing these models and adhering to that principle of avoiding out-of-home care where possible, the report also recommends a new process at juvenile hall intake 
that would activate a community-based organization that would work with probation, the young person and their family prior to detention to identify a safe place for that young person to stay. And then, you know, only if all other options have been exhausted, they would explain these new out-of-home options and provide warm handoffs and referrals that, um, to the option that works best for the young person. Um, and we feel confident that the infrastructure and the interest is there among community-based organizations in the county to support both of these models. Um, and as outlined in the report, we would encourage the county to consider a partnership model that would bring together at least two CBOs who could work collaboratively to design and run these. Um, next slide. So um, importantly, both of these options would be available to young people with different levels of system involvement, including in a purely preventive function. Um, both models would also be available via referrals from intake at juvenile hall in lieu of detention. And importantly, this family-based setting could serve as a temporary placement if a child welfare or juvenile justice placement is disrupted. We know that too often young people end up back in detention after running away from a placement, for example. Um, next slide. <laughs> so you can read more about this in the report itself, but um, the report outlines a set of principles that any community-based organization responsible for operating either of these models would adhere to, and that's really just in line with, um, with best practice in, in youth development. And then if you can go to the next slide, um, I'll just close here. You know, Santa Clara has a, a strong and robust set of government and community-based resources, and so the anchor community-based organizations responsible for operating these models would need to be fully integrated into that existing continuum. So you can see on this slide and in the report, the types of programming and services that would be available to girls and gender expansive youth, either directly through the anchor CBOs or through referrals. That includes peer supports, family mediation, crisis intervention, referral to a CSEC advocate, et cetera. Um, the only thing that, that I would be sure to emphasize on this list is the importance of offering immediate and ongoing economic supports. Um, case file reviews, as well as conversations with, with young people and, and systems leaders have just lifted up the ways in which the lack of economic support is really a significant barrier in young people being able to stay at home. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Mike or Victoria. Thank you, Hannah. And I, I think it's me. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Victoria. And um, in consultation with the Office of the County Council regarding laws, regulations, and licensing requirements relevant to the establishment of new residential solutions, the following two regulatory schemas were identified for the targeted population. And these are the homeless, Youth Homeless Prevention Centers and Resource Family Approval. Next slide, please. And um, slide nine talks about uh, leveraging our existing resources and what we're talking about are wraparound um, services. And wraparound is a strength-based planning process that occurs in a team setting to engage with youth and their families. The intent is to build on individual and family strengths to help families achieve positive goals and improve well-being. Family finding is focused on discovering and building connections for youth. In the discovery process, significant adults are identified and engaged as potential connections to help meet a youth's needs, including placement. Even if an identified family member may not be appropriate for placement, the goal is to engage the family member as a lifelong connection for the youth. Sometimes after establishing those connections, placement and permanency become an option. Parent permission refers to um, placements for youth, um, youth who may reside or are already residing in informal living arrangements made by their parents or guardians. This includes youth residing with relatives or other supportive adults, a privately secured a residential drug treatment program, and or a therapeutic residential treatment program. These arrangements vary in duration. Some are longer term and others are temporary in nature. Next slide, please. And this slide is uh, basically a visual of the variety of housing options that are currently um, in existence and a description or more detailed description of each can be found in the um, report that we submitted. And I'm gonna send it to Mike. So we wanted to be brief um, to leave a lot of um, opportunities for questions. Uh, I know there's more details in the report, but the next steps would be based on um, the direction from the board would be to develop um, our request for proposals to look at, you know, find agencies who would be um, able to and uh, able to carry out this this uh, mission and to also to develop with the innovative innovative ideas. 
and then to simply launch the procurement process thereafter to then secure those those services. Um, and with that, um, we are here for questions. Uh, we have a uh, kind of council probation, Vera, DFCS, um, standing by for your questions um, because it was a collaborative effort, and we know that the solution is going to come from a collaborative effort. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate all that. Um, before we go to the public comment, Judge Lucero, did you wish to comment at this time? Yes, I would like to um, thank Vera and the Department of Probation for collaborating on this proposal and remind everybody that in 2016, we would have an average of between 20 and 25 percent of our custodial population as girls. And um, over the last month, we've had either zero or one girl. Today, we have one girl in custody in the whole county. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's been a drastic reduction of um, uh, girls and, and, and gender expansive youth in custody because of the collaboration that has brought us here today. Um, I, don't, I just want us to remember that safety confinements for girls and gender expansive youth is kind of, a, of an oxymoron because safety and confinement um, you know, that's the, that's the term that we've often used to keep girls safe from exploiters or from drug and alcohol use. Um, and this is a national phenomena. It's not just us, but we're learning and all of our stakeholders are at the table, including the district attorney, to learn more about how we can um, do that trauma informed intervention. And it's, it's working. And I'd just like to thank you all for helping us achieve a long lasting um, getting to zero with these proposals. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're getting to zero is phenomenal. Um, staff members, board members, before I turn to you, just a little clarification. In the staff report, recommended action is to receive a report from the probation department, but there is more than that to this. Um, and I thank Vice President Ellenberg for pointing that out to me. There are recommended actions looking for our approval. So before I turn to you to give that approval or amendments or changes, whatever it is you wish, uh, let's hear from the public first. And David, two minutes each for the members of the public. Thank you, sir. One moment while we change the timer to two minutes. First speaker is Sharon Danoa. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you so much. I'm Sharon Danoa with the South Bay Coalition and Human Trafficking. And I just want to say we appreciate and support the proposal from probation and the Vera Institute support to support young people in our county. We know that housing is the single most crucial factor to stability for individuals, especially young people. We also know many marginalized young people engage in sex for survival to meet basic needs, including food and shelter. There's more information in the covenant study regarding this. Um, and not out, all housing is the same. It is crucial we have safe options of housing for young people that is centered on the young person's needs and their perspectives. We look forward to next steps for this proposal and again, appreciate the county's um, support on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Kiana. I've unmuted you. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Kiana Simmons. I'm the policy aide at the Bill Wilson Center and I'm speaking in support of expanding the continuum of housing options for girls and gender expansive youth. So Bill Wilson has been the, the major provider for alternative housing support for justice involved youth for many years. And with that experience, we have seen how needed alternative housing options are. In the past year and a half, Bill Wilson has received more than 100 referrals from police and probation directly. This is a very important issue that we are thrilled to see discussed with our community and county partners. The Bill Wilson Center is committed to intersectional race equity, which includes finding alternatives to juvenile hall and any carceral approach that keeps youth locked up. The county's probation department, juvenile hall and ranches uh, daily statistics show that overwhelmingly majority of the youth in detention are young men of color, specifically black and Latino young men. This is a pattern seen across the nation and the same is true in Santa Clara County. Up to 90% of detainee in juvenile hall are young men of color. Too many youth are being criminalized at increasingly younger ages and subjected to the juvenile justice system and or the adult criminal justice system. This is particularly true for youth who are poor, youth of color, youth with disabilities, youth with mental health and substance abuse challenges, youth, youth facing neglect, abuse and or violence, youth in foster care and LGBTQ youth. These youth are disproportionately pushed out of schools and pulled into unjust systems through arrests and incarceration, which exacerbates harm and increases the risk of abuse. 
All youth should have a childhood that provides the time and space for learning, mistakes, and restorative correction by caring adults and community members. We look forward to making these ideals a reality in our community, and we are supportive of this first step to do so. Thank you. Next speaker is Desiree Victor. I have unmuted you. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you. So my name is Desiree Victor. I'm the site director at the Young Women's Freedom Center. We support the recommendations detailed in the report by Vera. We have made strides as a county to get to zero girls incarcerated and are so close that it can happen. I want to defer to a quote from a young person that works here at the Young Women's Freedom Center. Um, and it's, today's decisions are tomorrow's realities. Life is a collection made of choices yesterday. And I defer to this quote because today's decisions and the strides that we've made uh, thus far to get to almost zero girls incarcerated and do a lot of the historical harm of the system um, was because of the courageous decisions made by the county um, two years ago. So this decision today can impact the generations to come. So we hope that you support the recommendations coming out of this support. Thank you. The next speaker is Irvish. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Thank you very much to all the board of supervisors, respective, uh, respective judge, uh, as well as the respective uh, county staff. I wanted to mention about uh, there was a lawsuit with regards to the Senate Bill 132 about the uh, about the constitutional changes that is to be made uh, by the uh, uh, by the bill that was introduced in the 2020. Uh, by the governor, Gavin Newsom, as it was to mention that the complaint was referred to that who transfer the female facilities by female or a non-binary pronoun such as she or they, and as well as to make sure that sometimes a transgender and LGBTQ, uh, uh, LGBTQ community persons are also being defined and being transferred to a transgender woman and also the transgender men being transferred to the women's prisoners. So that's the case that the lawsuit got unconstitutional and there were constitutional changes were made that the gender identity as well as the transgender lgbtq community individuals they are they are to they are to choose that you know what what kind of what kind of a person or they having the rights to where you know they are supposed to be living within the inmates or what type of uh, inmates you know they would be they would be living with and as well as to ensure that they have their own privacy right with this sb 132 bill also to ensure that you know, I want to talk about there. There are numerous policies on preventing the discrimination of a gender identity and the gender expression. But in the in the country of Canada and in the Ontario uh, in the Ontario province, with the Human Rights Commission, they have a specific policy where they give the individual rights, whether they are transgender women or a man. They have the right set of a uh, standard set that you know if they wanted to choose specifically male to female or female to female, they have their own privacy right and a policy uh, to to be implemented that you know where they choose to live and how they choose to live with with the type with the type of. Next speaker is Joycelyn. You have been unmuted. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Justin. I'm a lead fellow at Young Women's Freedom Center. As a former system impacted youth, I think our overall goal is to end all incarceration, and I support Vera's recommendation to the county. Thank you. Next speaker is Young Women's Freedom Center. I've unmuted you. You have two minutes to speak. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Angelique, uh, and I'm, I'm a self-determined advocate at the Young Women's Freedom Center. We know that implementing the recommendations detailed in the report would not only have a meaningful impact on the lives of girls and gender ex expensive youth who touch the justice system, it would also push the county towards achieving and sustaining its goals and ending girls' incarcerations. We hope that you support the recommendations coming out of the report. Thank you. The next speaker is Arabella Guevara. You have two minutes to speak. Oh, I'm sorry, I won't be able to uh, unmute them because they're using an old version of Zoom. So that concludes our request to speak, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And if you can hear me, please update your version. I'm going to turn to Dr. Smith first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to <clears throat> clarify about the report, I realize uh, there are a number of <clears throat> statements there about how we're going to proceed. Yes. Um, it doesn't really require action from the board specifically in the sense that 
this report tells you where we're going and how we're going to move forward. From an administrative perspective, obviously you may choose to uh, make a motion and reaffirm your commitment to what we're suggesting. But the reason the report doesn't have specific actions is because uh, it was considered to be an information report telling you where we're going based on previous actions from the board. Thank you, no, no problem. I think um, you've told us where we are, which is wonderful. You're telling us where we're going, which is wonderful. You're telling us how we're gonna get there, which is wonderful. So I'm hoping that our comments coming forward here um, will be wonderful as well. A lot of pressure, Vice President Ellenberg. Thank you very much, um, President Wasserman. And thank you so much to the staff for incorporating my feedback uh, from the June 2021 meeting with Supervisor Lee's original wonderful referral. I'm pleased to see the substantive response to that feedback and the thoughtful recommendations. I'm absolutely in support of the report, but I have just a couple of questions and then uh, some additional thoughts. Uh, first, does the department have an idea of which providers would be available for these two new specifically designed gender responsive residential options? And, and if so, can you share who they are? Uh, Supervisor Ellenberg, those would be RFP. So at this point, we couldn't identify who, but that we would definitely RFP them. Okay, got it. So that's gonna look like an open competitive bid process yeah. as opposed to single source, terrific. Yes, uh, Supervisor. Thanks, Chief, I appreciate that. Uh, at this Friday's um, upcoming Children, Family, and Seniors uh, meeting, the Office of Women's Policy is going to present on the uh, on our agenda a proposed implementation plan for prioritized recommendations of the CEDAW task force. The first priority on that grid is to create affordable, accessible, and safe housing solutions for women, emphasizing measures to address homelessness as a result of gender-based violence. This is also, I'm sure you all know, a high priority for our county multiple partners across agencies, um, including um, the Office of Supportive Housing and the Office of Gender-Based Violence Prevention are working on strategies through the housing work group. Does, does this align with the work of that group and, and, are, and are you all talking to each other to ensure that there's a sharing of resources and no duplication of efforts? So I can, I can start and then, or Chief Green, that you can <laughs> Jump in. Yeah, no, actually, I think Hannah, you would be a better person to answer because you, you're talking to everybody. <laughs> but sure, yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say we're, we're in close contact with OWP and with the Office of Gender Based Violence um, and also with um, folks at the South Bay Coalition and Human Trafficking because there's also some work that's happening specifically looking at housing for C sex survivors and just for survivors of, of trafficking and sexual assault in general. So we have been in close communication with them. I think that this aligns with the work that they're building and also just making sure that um, we're not duplicating anything so that this work kind of fits in and could take some of the place of thinking about what some of those temporary or crisis interventions could look like for CSEC survivors in particular or for minors. That's great, Hannah, thank you. It, it sounds like we are really moving away from segmenting populations for housing priority. Um, and this really has the possibility to make everything uh, a priority. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, how does, sorry, just one more piece of that though. How does the Office of Supportive Housing work within these asks? Are, are they a partner as well? Well, I know that um, OWP, especially under Protima Pandi, uh, met um, many times with um, Office of Supportive Housing when we were looking originally mm -hmm. for a place for these young women and girls when we identified them over a year ago as needing uh, a place to be. And also um, we're hoping that the Young Women's Freedom Center at the time might be able to, we might be able to locate a more permanent place for their agency as well. They are without a permanent place location at this time. So um, I don't, um, you know, the pandemic kind of changed the face of how we have been meeting and interacting and with our follow up. And I know there was a change of leadership with OWP as well, but um, I know that they have been involved in discussions in the past. Great. Thanks so much, Judge Lucera. And I want to add my thanks to the Young Women's Freedom Center for providing support to young women, girls, uh, transgender, non gender non-conforming and gender expansive youth. 
impacted by the juvenile justice system in our county uh, since 2019 now. I also want to thank those that are working on the initiative to end girls incarceration at the Vera Institute of Justice, OWP, probation and juvenile courts through the Juvenile Justice Gender Responsive Task Force for really working so well to better understand and disrupt pathways into custody for girls and gender expansive youth. Any efforts to divert youth from carceral institutions um, is overwhelmingly uh, a good and needed thing in our communities. I hope that the programs at some point will expand to include all justice involved youth regardless of gender. Uh, and I look forward to starting that conversation as well. Thanks again. Thank you, Vice President. It's absolutely incredible. We only have one girl incarcerated right now. Supervisor Lee. Well, thank you, uh, President Wasserman, again. First and foremost, I would like to thank both uh, Judge Catherine Lucero, the Chief of Probation, Laura Garnett, Hannah Green from the Vera Institute, and Desiree Victor from the Young Women's Freedom Center, and all your staff collaborating to produce this very excellent report. I know that staff from DFCS also played an important role as well. I'm very, very proud of this extraordinary work that this team has helped moving forward. This is innovative and taking a chance on something that hasn't been done before and is going to make a lot of positive change in the youth's life. As noted in the referral, housing instability in the family, concern over the youth's personal safety, or conflict within the family often serve as barriers for these justice-involved girls and gender expensive youth and being able to return to their home after being released from juvenile hall. So by moving on to these two possible recommendations in the staff report, a small multi-youth residential and family-based temporal residential care program, we will continue to promote a better and healthier housing solution for girls that is not in an incarceral setting like juvenile hall or a ranch. Therefore, I would like to move to receive the report and request that we also move forward, but request for a proposal RFP to establish a small multi-youth residential and family-based temporal residential care program as recommended by staff. I and that not. process- oh, you, Apologies, I thought the motion was over. <laughs> we don't even need a motion, but we have a motion and we have a seconded by Vice President Ellenberg. Very exciting. And, uh, yeah, then to explain a little bit more, in that process, we shouldn't limit ourselves to looking at just current county facilities or CBOs, but to explore partnering with philanthropy uh, on a facility or home that could be donated uh, to the county or CBO. We'd like to mimic this program in the future for all justice-involved kids, including justice-involved boys, and now starting with justice-involved girls and gender expensive youth at this point to just pilot this concept. And finally, I would like to ask that the administration continue conversation with Judge Lucero and juvenile justice agencies in supporting the development of the housing program and any wraparound services that would be needed to be included for the success of the youth. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion, we have a second. I'll be happy to support it. Supervisor Chavez. Yeah, thank you. Um, so first of all, really exciting. Otto, thank you for bringing this forward. And Susan, thank you for leaning in. And just we have great leadership. Uh, Judge Lucero, it's always good to see you and, and Chief Garnett. Um, just one recommendation I wanted to make, it, and that is that as the RFP is being crafted, I think it would be ideal to have the Office of Supportive Housing as part of the crafting team. Because I, I will say this, that I think um, we really need to to align um, our housing continuum through one department of the county. And I think if they're at least leaning in, to, I, I would say there are two opportunities there. I think one is um, just they have, they bring a tremendous amount of skill. Um, but the other is that as we continue to better understand what our role is gonna be vis-a-vis -vis housing, a lot of that, um, that history is gonna sit in that particular department. Um, and I really um, also think that the, the work that we're doing around um, homelessness and housing is gonna be critical to stay connected to this because as my colleagues know, that um, tool, that instrument that we're using to look at risk assessment is gonna continue to be um, evaluated and upgraded and updated and that will have impacts on all different segments of the continuum. So I, I think if we could include them, that would be ideal. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to say, um, I, I think the, um, 
the leadership of the Coalition to End Human Trafficking is, you know, I, Sharon, I was so glad to hear you speak today because it just reminded me that again, um, we really want to think about the um, the situations that these young people are in and recognize there's a continuum and that it's not a straight line, and that um, and so having these partnerships with with uh, folks who are helping us understand the risk of this victimization throughout their the process as young people are getting prepared to launch is is very very important for us to all uh, keep our eye on which i know is a current of what you all are doing uh, but appreciate all the partners so thank you and thanks for letting me uh, lean in a little thank you supervisor so we have a motion by supervisor lee a second by vice president ellenberg we have heard from the public we've heard from the panelists I don't see anybody else raising their hand. Mr. Leone, roll call vote, please, on item number 19. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. President Wasserman. Aye. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 20 was, con was uh, dealt with under and approved under consent. We now move on to item 21. We probably have our Deputy County Executive, Sylvia Gallegos, presenting. And this is the Title IX Compliance Audits and Community Engagement Next Steps. And this is informational as well. Um, yeah, with receiving report. Mr. Chair, my apologies for the interruption. I think item 21 was placed on consent this morning. Oh, I, I missed that one. Then. Okay, 20 and 21 and 22, correct? Correct. The only one I have left is 23. And I see 23. 24 was consent, 25 and 26 were held, and no items were pulled. So we, we go to number 23. Thank you, David. You're welcome. And I go to 23. I'm sure Sylvia was freaking out somewhere. All right, 23, we have Paul Lorenz and Jeff Draper, options for the creation of a North County West Valley Health Center clinic in District 5. Yes, thank you, President Wasserman. Mr. Uh, as your board is aware, on October 19th, uh, Simidian did request that we report back on the development of a North County clinic health center, as we refer them to, because it will be a comprehensive family medicine, family practice, um, offering pediatrics, women's health, as well as a variety of specialty services. Those services will be further identified as we work with the community and our community partners in the development of that health center. Um, as noted in the report, uh, the health system is working closely with facilities to identify a location in District 5. Uh, the challenge, of course, is the market is, is very tight. Um, so we put forward a couple of different options, one is which is to identify a large facility or a couple of smaller facilities to accommodate the services that I've identified. Uh, I know that uh, Jeff Draper may be on the line and can ask, answer further questions on the timeline, but our goal is to identify the facility as quickly as possible um, so that we can begin the design process and report back to your board. Thank you very much. Sura Smitty. I'd like to exhort the staff to move as quickly as possible uh, I continue to be frustrated, as I'm sure our staff is, at the length of time it takes to go from a notion to a delivery of services. Um, I will simply move that we receive the report and direct staff to provide progress reports uh, on a quarterly basis at the Health and Hospital Committee uh, February, May, August, and November being the cycle. Thank you very much. So that, that's it. That's appreciate that. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is raised. Yes. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm excited to um, have have something in North County. So I want to I want to just say I'm very supportive of the direction. Um, this is more of a question in terms of um, market studies and, and I'm just curious as to whether or not as we've been thinking about the um, expansion of the clinic side of that aisle if we have done a recent market study and if so um, does that market study help us understand how big 
clinics should be and, and their locations. And, and uh, Paul, the reason I'm asking the question is we were having this discussion about another, another um, it site. It got me thinking a lot about the, um, the location of clinics and how they feed into the, the right. health, health I'm, I'm sorry, the hospital system, and also even making sure that we have enough mental health services placed around the county. So anyway, I, I, do we have such a study? Is that something that you've already given the board and I didn't read? So in fact, we've uh, enlisted uh, someone to help us with a specific study in the North County. Uh, we do these periodically to really assess those areas of the counties for which we don't have geographic coverage of services to ensure that you know, we're addressing the needs of those communities. So we are, in fact, doing another review uh, to get more demographics uh, in current statistics around the need. Uh, but based on the overall study that was provided in the report, in terms of a very high level, clearly uh, there are individuals in the community will, that will clearly benefit from services that are geographically available to them. Yes. Um Perhaps this this market study it this doesn't appear to be an to be honest with you it doesn't look like a market analysis it looks like a like a very high level um, that is correct and and so we have elicited it and moved forward with a specific market demographic study to get down to the detail and um, by that, age group. Uh, okay. and type of services that would benefit the community. And also, I, I'm, I'm assuming insurance coverage and all that as well? In, insurance coverage, uh, providers within the area, et cetera. And then, and then Paul, I don't want to slow the one that's being done here down because it should happen. And I'm again, I'm very supportive of this. What I had understood, and this was years ago, was that we had one that we were doing that was countywide. And it might have been around the time that we um, purchased the hospitals, uh, or right before that, that we were looking at um, that kind of assessment, in particular because we were looking at clinic placement for the county's clinics relative to other clinics that were already out there. And, um, and so what I would just encourage um, the staff to do is to is to think about, you know, not again, not to slow down District 5, we want to, we want to be supportive, but I am really interested in our bigger plan about how we're doing assessments of the types of clinics where they need to be, what size footprint they need to be, what kind of services they need to be providing countywide. Yes, and, and so we can provide the board an off-agenda report on the studies that we've begun, um, both in District 5, um, but also other studies that we have also engaged in. For example, in the South County, uh, when we're looking at the type of services, et cetera, we do engage someone that understands how to pull the appropriate demographics and understand payers, providers, uh, et cetera. So we're happy to share that uh, with the board off agenda. Paul, do you have a third, who's the, uh, um, the, do we have a third party that's doing these analysis for us? Yes, we do. Do you know who that is? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I can't think of the consultant. So what I would just say is if you could, wouldn't mind sharing with the board, um, nothing fancy. If these are already done, just shoot them out to us. I, I just would be interested in understanding what goes into those analysis. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thank you. And we have one speaker. Dave, if you'll please allow that person for two minutes. All and right, Supervisor Lee, I'll come back to you if that's all right. Next speaker is Devin Conley. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You will have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, my name is Devin Conley, and I'm a trustee with the Mountain View Wisman School District in North County and District 5. I am thrilled to see this proposal to expand healthcare access in my community. I think it will directly benefit our students. Um, to give you a little bit of context, 30% of our kindergarten through eighth grade elementary school district is composed of low income students. At our highest needs school, Castro Elementary School, um, we have 20% of our students who are currently homeless. And so I know that there is a significant need for healthcare access, um, a relationship with a pediatrician and doctor on a regular basis that this type of clinic could provide. And just a plug for 
um, how to push vaccinations forward. We have found that it seems that individuals and families with a direct trusting relationship with a pediatrician or doctor, a medical home is another way to term it, um, are much more likely to get vaccinated because they're, they're receiving that guidance from someone whom they trust. And so it's even more imperative that we have medical services and easily accessible um, clinics that are located near our low-income families so that they can get the information they need to also keep their children and our community safe. Thank you. That concludes our request to speak. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. Um, I really don't have any questions, but I would like to take a moment to thank my colleague, Supervisor Smidian, for putting forth this important referral. The North County West Valley Health Center Clinic is certainly long, long overdue. This clinic will help alleviate so much of the burden and pressure, for example, at the VHC uh, Sunnyvale, uh, which is just within the D3 boundary closest to District 5, with an average wait time of being 22 days. 22 days. That really is not good. And that's what would turn people to use ER instead when they should really go to urgent care. The pandemic has also led many residents to receive healthcare services from the county, such as the COVID-19 tests and vaccinations. So therefore, as we prepare for the future of pandemics uh, and any type of public health emergencies, it is certainly important to have a clinic in the North County West Valley area to protect and promote public health. As the study shows, uh, additional 10 to 25,000 residents in District 5 would benefit from this opening. So I would say, let's do it ASAP. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, when I first read this, I saw District 5, and so I started thinking where in Los Gatos this clinic should go. But then I realized you were talking North County. All right, I'm with you. We have the uh, report received. And David, that moves us down to adjournment. Fellow supervisors, our shortest meeting of the year. Nice to end it. Be our year ending. Excuse me, right? Mr. Chairman. Did did we need a formal vote uh, to receive the report, uh, given the direction to report to um, yes, with the direction. committee? Forgive me. Yes, Thank with you. The direction. So that's your motion. And Supervisor Chavez, your second. second. Thank you. Roll call vote, please, David. Supervisor Lee. Aye. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. Vice President Ellenberg. Yes. And President Wasserman. Yes, as well. Thank you very much. I want to wish all of you a healthy and happy holiday season. We'll see you around the 11th, I think, of January. When are we meeting next, David? January 11th, sir. January 11th. We are there. I want to thank all the supervisors, and more importantly, I want to thank all the staff of Santa Clara County that make our county run so wonderfully and be at the top of so many things and help so many people. and and still every single day strive to do it better. Thank you all very much. God bless. See Happy you around. holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone. Be Happy safe. Happy holidays. Thank you. Recording stopped.